Well, we've begun Paul's second letter to Timothy. In our last lesson, we simply introduced the letter. We looked at the first two verses. But it's time for us to move from that transition into the substance of the letter itself. But before we do that, let me get, again give you a story or an illustration. It's been many years ago now. I was probably 13 or 14 years old. That's a long time ago when I took driver's education. I don't know if you have that here in this country, but before you can get your driver's license in America, you have to take a test in writing and pass the test, but you also have to have some practice in driving. So our particular instructor in our high school happened to also be the basketball coach, and he had a reputation for a very fiery style, a very dynamic style. But when it came to teaching us driver's ed, he, he told us that he was going to do something. He said, as we're driving along, and so I, I'm driving as a student, and he's sitting in the seat over here. He said, I want to let you know that at some point, I'm going to try to scare you. And at some point, we're going to be driving along, and he said, you'll not be thinking about anything. And he says, I'm going to yell, stop. And he says, it is your job when I yell, stop, to stop. Step on the brake as quickly as you can and come to a complete stop. And I said, fine. And he says, but let me tell you what happened one time when I tried this experiment with somebody else. He said, I told this student what I was going to do, and it happened to be a young lady, and they were driving down the street, and she was thinking about something else, or he was talking to her, and all of a sudden he said, stop. But instead of stepping on the brake, she screamed, she threw up her hands in the air, and she stepped on the accelerator. And she went zooming down the street. It's like, stop! <laughs> she did the exact opposite of what she was supposed to do because she had gotten scared. She wasn't ready to face this particular thing he told her to do. So that made a big impression upon me that I was going to be ready, that when this fear thing came, I was going to be prepared for it. When it comes to the Christian life, I would make a statement like this. What we do with our fear tells us a lot about our faith. What we do with our fear says a great deal about the substance of our faith. When we come to this letter called 2 Timothy, and we look at Paul, and we look at Timothy, and we look at their relationship, and where Paul is at this stage of his life, he could be sitting in that prison experiencing a great deal of fear. When are they going to take me? When are they going to lift me out of this place? When are they going to uh, strangle me? When are they going to cut off my head? And he could be sitting there living in terror, and he doesn't, because he has a substantive faith. You see, what we do with our fear tells us a lot about our faith. You say, well, I've only been a Christian for a short period of time. I'm not sure that my faith is very great. Or you say, well, I've, I've been a Christian a long time, but I, I still have a fear of a great many things. You think of the Apostle Paul's experience in that first day when he met Jesus Christ on that road to Damascus, how that could have been a fearful thing. Because it changed him, it transformed him. It was a bright light, it was the sound of Jesus Christ. And instead of being fearful, he took what would have been a natural experience of fear and he used it to motivate and shape his entire faith system. That Paul, in the, 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 the depth of his faith, grew and practiced and exercised his faith, and he used it in so many incredible ways. But now he's at the end of his life, and he's sitting in prison. And he could be very much afraid. And he sits down and takes out some parchment and a pen and ink, and he begins to write this letter. And as he begins to write this letter to Timothy, he's thinking about Timothy and his fears. We know that Timothy was shy. We know that Timothy, Timothy had insecurities. We know that Timothy was fearful, that he was sickly, that he didn't have perfect health, and that Timothy was always in a state of wondering, oh, isn't anyone going to rescue me from here? Something like that. And as he writes this letter, his, his motivation to Timothy in the section we're about to see today is, is to reflect and remember on a variety of things that will help take away some of the fear that I think Timothy is feeling, and certainly fear that Paul could be feeling, but is not. 
Our image that we're going to use with this series and these lessons is navigation. Navigation. We said sometimes we'll tell you to navigate away from dangerous icebergs. Sometimes we'll say to navigate towards the waters that are safe. Today we're going to navigate towards something. And if I would give it a label or a heading, I would say navigating toward courageous, gifted service. Courageous, gifted service. We're going to see that in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 3 through 7. So I'd like you to take your Bibles, and I'd like to read with you 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 3 through 7. This is what it says. I thank God whom I serve, as did my ancestors, with a clear conscience, as I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. As I remember your tears, I long to see you, that I may be filled with joy. I'm reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now, I'm sure, dwells in you as well. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love, and self-control. Do you see that? Not a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power and love and self-control. When I'm talking to my, my people back in our church about this, there, there's a little phrase that we have in English that I don't know if it will even work in Russia, but it's a phrase that goes like this, use it or lose it. Use it or lose it. That if you have a particular talent, and you use it for the glory of God, and you exercise it, and you practice it, and you, you use it in the service of Jesus Christ, God is going to use that gift. But if you have a gift that God has given you, and you never use it, and you never practice it, and you never use it for the glory of God, it's going to wither up and dry away. Let me give you an example. There are some gifts that people have that are just natural gifts. You say, you know, He's just good at talking, or she's just really good at helping people. But when you become a follower of Jesus Christ, we talked about this briefly in our study in 1 Timothy, we believe that the Holy Spirit gives certain gifts, supernatural abilities to people to accomplish the work that God's given them to do. And again, we talked about the variety of lists that the New Testament talks about. Like I said, I have the gift of teaching that I think there's part of me that there's a natural teaching ability in me. But when I became a Christian, God said, my Holy Spirit is going to give you the ability not just to teach anything or just to teach about flowers or trees, which is fine. But Bruce, I'm going to use you to teach the Word of God, to help explain what the Word of God says. And it's going to bear fruit in, in ways that you may or may not ever see. But I come back to that statement. You have to use it and the ability that God gives you, or you're going to lose it if you don't put it into action. Let me give you an example. I've, I've told you that my favorite sport is basketball. So in all the years that I played, and that I, I still play some to this day, I just can't run as fast or jump as high, but I still love the sport of basketball. And over the many years that I've played or that I've coached or I've been involved in the sport, I've met a lot of different people. For example, I've met a number of people who are very, very gifted in the sport. I told you about the young man from our, from our school who became Mr. Basketball in 1992. He had great skill, but the thing with him was he worked very hard, not just resting on his gift, but developing it and broadening it and deepening it. And I've met other people who are very gifted at the sport of basketball, but they don't work at it at all. They're lazy, their attitude is poor, they don't really care. It's like, well, maybe I'll play today, maybe I won't. And they're terrible people to have on a team because you know that they can score 25 points or they can get 15 rebounds, but you don't know if on that night they really care enough to come and even play. Both have gifts. One uses it and becomes excellent. The other one doesn't care, doesn't exercise, and in effect ends up not being significant at all. What Paul is telling Timothy is, Timothy, you've been given a gift. You've got to use it. Let me show you what that looks like and, and how we can serve. 
And what's interesting about the way these verses lay out is Paul begins with a variety of things that he remembers about Timothy. The last section talks about some things that he wants to remind Timothy of. But in these first three verses, he says to Timothy, I remember when, I remember when, or I remember this. As if saying to Timothy, Timothy, remember, remember, remember? When you get tired, when you get sick, when you get distracted, you're not exercising your gift the way that you should. So, we invite you to participate in the International Bible Teaching and Gospel Sharing Project. Whether these Christian expanded educational opportunities will become available to people around the world depends on all of us. We very much need and value your prayer and financial support. For more information, please visit www.tvseminary.com. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS Ministry. You may give online at efca.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300 or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com.